Hello and welcome everyone to uh, my lecture on British landscapes, national identity, national histories in Sarah Moss's fiction. Uh, I've subtitled this lecture Ghosts from the Motherland um, to really talk a bit about and to think a bit about the sort of Gothic undertones inscribed within, uh, within Sarah Moss's fiction. Um, I would also like before, before I start properly to thank Dr. Blanco Milen um, very much for inviting me to give this lecture today and I greatly look forward to our Q&A live next week. Also, it's just wonderful to see uh, uh, old Kent connections rekindled and forging new, new scholarly partnerships. So thank you very much for, for this wonderful opportunity. It may sound strange to give a talk on British history, sense of place, national identity, and its most detrimental nationalistic strands in the context of post-colonial fiction, and especially given that I am talking today about a white British author. After all, studying how writers from the global south use the language and literary forms of former colonial powers to claim a space in the globalized literary canon and to tell stories of those who have previously been marginalized seems to be the furthest that could possibly be from an analysis of old European powers and the cultural hegemonies they have created and cemented. And yet, even in a novel with global perspectives and scopes, such as Kieran Desai's Inheritance of Loss, which you are studying at present, key symbols of British culture and cultural influence over, over Indian culture are all over the place. Cho Oyu, Sai's and the Judge's House, where a lot of the action takes place, is a replica of a British mansion in the mountains. The characters pride themselves of drinking tea with cow's milk, English style and eating roast beef while giving one another gifts from shopping centre Marks and Spencer for Christmas. In the post-colonial setting that Desai depicts, these imitations of a British lifestyle, and in particular the house, are fake replicas, echoes of a nostalgic desire to be part of a cultural elite aligned with British values, whatever this expression means, at a time when that system of values is falling apart. If you've already finish reading Inheritance of Loss, or if you have not read it, you will, you will find out uh, very early on in, uh, when embarking on, on reading the novel, you will find out that the first chapter sees Gorka guerrilla fighters from lower social groups storming into Cho over you, stealing guns and what little valuables are left and demanding food, batteries, clothing. It is crucial to think of this scene as a desacralization of the house owned by the upper class, upper caste Anglophile judge and his granddaughter. Why is it so important though? Why is this scene so crucial? Why, what are the implications of this violent intrusion in terms of the relationship between home, its rightful inhabitants and owners, and those who want to lay a claim on it? And more generically, what does the house represent across the history of the British Empire and its aftermath in contemporary culture and specifically in Sarah Moss. Bearing these questions in mind, I would like to start this lecture by thinking about a bit about the stately home or the English country house in history and culture before reflecting on its Gothic and Neo-Victorian afterlives. In particular, I will discuss how such ideas of home and especially ideas of, of luxurious domesticity associated with it are embedded in ideas around nation, empire, and ultimately an exclusion of the other. And finally, I will use these frameworks to analyze the three novels that I've just shown you uh, here, Night Waking, which engages directly with the old traditional English and colonial mansion, while Ghost Wall and Summer Water, of which you have read extracts, take that paradigm into new national and nationalistic directions involving the natural environment and landscape a bit more as well, towards what scholars, some scholars have called Brexit, or the literature of on and around Brexit. According to postcolonial scholar Ian Baucom, the stately home is a cultural artifact, a spectacular arrangement of built place valued less for itself than for the absence or lack that it at once covers and names. Note that Baucom here underlines a duplicity inscribed within the English country house, a cultural artifact of value. It is valued more for the absence or the lack that it embodies, that, that, is, what, that is missing 
than for its outer appearance alone. Also, Baucom states that there is something that it at once covers and names. What are we to make of this? What can we say about this idea of uh, what is covered and what is voiced out loud? The answer to this question, I think, is double. It is a nostalgia of an idealized past, especially the times that made that great house or which made that house and its inhabitants great, which often coincide, of course, and an exclusivity to that house and lifestyle. In other words, for that house to be that great and luxurious and beautiful and wonderful and dreamlike, and for its inhabitants to have the resources to build, maintain and inhabit it, others, such as low class, foreign people, homeless and other marginalized communities are the outcasts of society. Scholarly work at the intersection between history, literature and modern and contemporary culture by academics such as Ian Baucom, Simon Joyce, Louisa Hadley and Elizabeth Ho and more recently Corinne Fowler in the books that I've uh, uh, whose covers are, are there on the slide have explored the role of the stately home the British country house in popular culture, such as films and tourist practices. The time of biggest revival of these homes and their active use in the heritage, film and tourism industries were the 1980s. Importantly, not only did Margaret Thatcher famously and actively call for a return to the values of a bygone era, the Victorian era, but she also established the Department of National Heritage, later to be called Department of Culture, Media and Sport. A stately home, therefore, becomes from this moment on a key symbol of a lifestyle of a period from the past to look back to, to desire and dream about while crucially not materially accessible to the many. And contemporary media can exploit this conjuncture in, in two ways, mostly. One is to make money, of course, through obviously uh, film sets, tourism, etc., and to promote a political agenda of nostalgia. And obviously, films play a great role in this as well and popular culture in general. The two are obviously intertwined. Um, as this quote shows, um, shows uh, or the quote that I will show you rather, uh, shortly onwards shows very clearly, and which is, uh, which is by one of Margaret Thatcher's former secretaries of state, Virginia Bottomley. Tapping into and contributing to shaping and reshaping a common sense of nostalgia for the past was very much what Thatcher herself had in mind in her retrieval of Victorian values and her celebration of the Victorian period more in general. While on the one hand, this expression was meant to indicate the need for individuals to work hard and fend for themselves, it also referred to a rose-tinted glance back towards a mythical, better if adulterated past. And she says, and she famously said that we were taught to work jolly hard. We were taught to prove yourself. We were taught self-reliance. We were taught to live within our income. You were taught that cleanliness is next to godliness. You were taught self-respect. You were taught always to give a hand to your neighbor. You were taught tremendous pride in your country. All of these things are Victorian values. They are also perennial values. And here is the other quote within the quote that I mentioned before. Um, Simon Joyce, in his book aptly called The Victorians in the Rearview Mirror, explores this conjuncture between Victorian values as Thatcher interpreted them and the, the propaganda that they were co-opted into in terms of the film and heritage industry. And he says that it was under Thatcher's leadership that the Department of National Heritage was formed with an explicit agenda for filmmakers. One Secretary of State at the Department, Virginia Bottomley, urged them to promote our country, our cultural heritage, and our tourist trade. This is what films like Sense of Sensibility did as well as the BBC's Pride and Prejudice. Both of these were in the 1990s. If we have got the country houses and the landscapes, they should be shown on film, particularly as we approach the millennium. Extending the work of the National Trust and encouraging the continuation of the cult of the country house, Thatcher oversaw a growth industry in preservation and new building based on old design. In preparation for today's 
uh, session, I asked you to listen to Sophie Elisbex's song, Love is a Camera, and to watch its video on YouTube, uh, something that, which I hope many of you have been able, or most of you have been able to, to do. And uh, obviously I hope that you've enjoyed it, but I also hope that you've noticed a couple of aspects that I, that I would like to discuss now. So yes, it does take place in a big, in a big mansion, in a wonderful and a wonderful historical building. And obviously there is the whole play with the witch and the cameras and, uh, and, and the terrible deeds that she does to her victims in this quite nonetheless playful and ironic song and video. But importantly, this video is shot in Italy on the Tuscan Hills around Florence. And you see here on the right hand side of the slide, a 1903 photograph of Florence. So this is not from the video itself. Um, telling the story of a cruel witch, witch who through cunning stratagems kidnaps passers-by, takes their picture and keeps them trapped still ever more as the line from the song goes on her walls. By taking photographs, the witch traps their souls and reduces them to flat, silent commodities, beautiful faces to stare at in a growing gallery of victims. The costumes, interior design, and of course the medium of the photo camera all indicate that we are watching a scene happening in the 19th century. Of course, the irony being that when we, the spectators, watch the video, we're not physically trapped by Ellis Bex's witch, but we're only visually mesmerized by the aesthetics. The detail of Italy is not to be omitted. While, of course, a country with a very rich historical literary tradition that, that stands alone and speaks for itself, Italy has become and became, from the 19th century onwards, from the Romantic period onwards, a land of, a, a land of marvels and, um, and, a wonderful, and a wonderful destination as well as a source for inspiration for privileged travelers of the Grand Tour, as well as British artists of the caliber of Mary and Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, Robert Browning, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Vernon Lee, and many others. Many of these writers actually either spent some, some part, uh, parts of their lives in Italy, some of them died there after a long, uh, after many, many years there, some of them died tragically uh, in their youth, such as Percy Shelley in Italy, and they all wrote about it, they all integrated it within, within their, own, their own writing. So it is not surprising that there is also this sort of Italian component to reimaginations of, of, uh, um, of the Victorian period. More recently, and to come back to the films, the merchant ivory industry was also instrumental in creating a certain image of, of Italy, a romanticized image uh, of Italy. Uh, so it is not surprising that um, iconic films such as A Room with a View and, uh, uh, and, and Call Me By Your Name, which is actually much more recent and not set in the 19th century, tap into um, images of, of a perfect Italy, of a wonderful, beautiful Italy, similar to what Elispexa does. Uh, and obviously plays with in, in her own video. Elis Bex's video arguably does not claim to have the same impact as, as a motion ivory film, but we can safely say that it speaks to similar aesthetics surrounding a contemporary nostalgia for the Victorian era. The specific setting is this old elegant house with a spooky dangerous undertone. The video and the song obviously directly engage with the art of photography, technology that was created in the 19th century and which was swiftly adapted and swiftly became a symbol of innovation, artistic creation, but also of uncanny doubles. We're here in the domain, I think, both of the Victorian, but also the New Victorian and the Gothic, two perspectives which in contemporary scholarship can penetrate one another, but do not necessarily correspond and, and, uh, and overlap. In particular, the Gothic uh, emerged in late 18th, early 19th century, in the same period that I described before uh, in relation to, to the Romantic writers. Um, and Italy is, is, is a frequent setting uh, in, in, in Gothic writing as well, especially with all the tropes related to the Catholic Church or the castles, the nuns, the monks. They're always seen as, as tropes of the frightful tropes of the other. Um, 
that, that the Gothic sort of speaks to. The New Victorian instead uh, only emerged in, in, in the 20th century, so after the Victorian period itself, quite logically. And while scholars debate about its exact starting date, it is normally said to, to coincide with White Saga Sosi, 1966. White Saga Sosi, if, if you don't know, is uh, this novel by Jean Rees, which rewrites Jane Eyre from the point of view of Bertha Mason. And essentially, New Victorianism is usually termed to be referring to books, stories, films that are more than historical fiction set in the 19th century. To be part of the New Victorianism, texts must, in some respect, be self-consciously engaged with the act of reinterpretation, rediscovery and revision concerning the Victorians. The New Victorian properly uh, interrogates the Victorian past, as Joyce uh, says in the book that I mentioned before, through the rear view mirror. So obviously through this sort of reflected gaze and obviously photography and the mirror come back in this, uh, in this image as well. While the Victorian period is getting ever more distant in time, it is always present, however, in the cultural memory of contemporary British architecture in national commemorations and public celebrations such as uh, Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee that will be celebrated in June, or, or uh, contemporary practices such as steampunk, for example, which are becoming more and more, uh, more and more mainstream. Closer to us in literary studies, it is the Victorian novel that is still seen as a benchmark of what belongs or doesn't belong, as a touchstone against which contemporary writing, art and drama have to uh, have to measure up. This affects obviously literary curricula taught in schools and university and even in literary scholarship academic jobs are divided in pre-modern which normally means pre-19th century and modern and contemporary from this Victorian period onwards. So it is obviously this important this important signifier in, in modern and contemporary culture in the literary world and beyond. The Gothic also has this huge legacy. And in the contemporary, it not only operates in terms of reviving the past through its frightful, uncanny aspects, um, but it is also a way to reflect on, on the contemporary. Megan de Bramollet argues that as a society, we look back to the Gothic and we engage and produce and reproduce the Gothic precisely at times of transition and huge change such as these. And she says that the 21st century's own deep entanglement with the past and insecurity about the future is, is reflected in our projection of these onto the Gothic. Looking at ways the past manifests in the narratives of our Gothic present may not tell us why contemporary culture remains obsessed with falsifying the past, but it shows us that the meaning we draw from these texts is always multiple, with implications that extend beyond the Gothic past's flashy surface and into its frightful depths. It expects the song is but one playful and perhaps not very well known example of, of this. But it is also an interesting way to think about the mansion in and the, the, the big country mansion in relation to the Gothic, linking it back to the origins of the genre and connecting it to its contemporary renditions and how the Gothic past flashes surface uh, and into its frightful depths. The Gothic in general and Gothic houses more specifically, therefore, become a key signifier of a society or a family or a world on the verge of abyss, on the verge of an unease about the relationship between family and community, family and nation, between personal and political, and primarily between past and present. The stately mansion has its sort of counterpart in, uh, in the, the large city or townhouse. In London, just as in other European capitals, such as Vienna or Paris, redesigned in the second half of the 19th century with the Grand Boulevard or the Ringstrasse, where city residences of the wealthy up-and-coming bourgeois families combine large apartments with offices and where literally next door to aristocratic residences um, are meant to be 
to be a display of wealth and industry in the sense of hard work. They show who matters and who doesn't in the city. They mean business, progress, but also beauty, philanthropy, obviously, uh, and innovation at the same time. But they also show a clear demarcation between the servants, the porters, deliverers, postmen, as well as obviously the, the, the domestic servants in the household, and the servant class and the owners and the owner's class, those who receive a service by compensating it. And like poorer city areas or traditional farmers' cottages, for example, where indoors and outdoors overlap also for lack of space, for the large city houses, as well as the country houses owned by the upper middle classes, the house is also a barrier between what is inside, what happens inside, and what stays outside, and what is destined to remain outside, excluded, and separated. This architectural clear demarcation cements the link between private property and privacy, two words which have the same root, and it limits access to domestic spaces only to those invited, those who are allowed in and welcome, those who are deemed suitable to, to enter the private space. An aspect which includes in the contemporary tourism industry, those who pay a ticket to enter and visit or who book a night in a castle or palace for a proper immersion in past lifestyles. Everybody else is seen as an intruder and a welcome presence. And this is something that I was thinking about recently because contemporary society, it seems to me, has quite an obsession with domesticity and social media, YouTube, um, TikToks, etc., have made this, this barrier more blurred, obviously, because we can physically access, for example, we cannot physically access, for example, the Kardashians' homes, but we can look into them through through the medium of, of the camera. So again, the, the medium of photography and, and film is quite is quite um, powerful here. Um, so obviously, it is also uh, an aspect that, let's say, those very capitalists or their descendants have capitalized on, have quite literally, have quite literally invested on in, in making further sort of profits and rebranding the home as a new product to repurpose and sell in the new digital consumer society. But on the other hand, to be without a home is to be homeless. And at the other end of, uh, of the spectrum, there is a condition that is seen as deplorable, but also uh, degrading for one's position in society. There is nothing worse in modern, urban, urbanized societies than to be homeless without a job uh, or without a clear position in society. Those are the people that nobody considers, nobody looks at, even on the street. Those that society treats as less than humans. Those that Sigmund Bauman, in his book Wasted Lives, calls um, calls well well. The, the, the wasted lives, those he considers them as opposed to an us. Ian Baucom also reminds us uh, not only about having a home in general, but how the country house is a marker of power. Built in the European metropolis, so in the idyllic countryside, thanks to the money gained through imperial commerce of, or warfare, it is deeply embedded within the national history of the nation, of the place, of the state, to the point where it becomes a symbol of the contradictions of how contemporary European countries, and Britain in particular, commemorate their past while nostalgically looking back to it, because obviously the big secret of the division, the class division that we see, for example, in a picture such as this, and in the big division between who belongs and who doesn't belong within the luxurious house, is the question of uh, of empire and imperial deeds. And Malcolm says that it is his country house, England, so note how he conflates the two. This ordered and disciplinary England that at once is financed by the economies of empire and marks in dazzling expanses of Italian marble and filigreed iron, the dominion of the metropolis over domestic and colonial countrysides for which a current generation of English nostalgics yearns. As such an object of remembrance and mourning, the country house is more than a mere arrangement of built space. If it were that, it could not be mourned, for across the surface of the English countryside, the great houses survive. What is mourned is what has failed to survive and what those houses, though so vast, can now only fragmentarily represent. 
They ordered the hegemonic moral economy of England's privileged classes, the heyday of British capital, the national and imperial project of identity formation, the Pax Britannica. It is in its invocation of these, though finally they never existed as they are remembered or imagined, that the country house is mournfully named that it is fetishized. It is as such that it must be read, not as a desired thing, but as a surviving fragment of the lost object of desire. So remember what I said at the beginning about the country house symbolizing a loss. This is exactly what this loss refers to. And just to briefly explain in case some of you don't know, the expression Pax Britannica, which directly uh, reinvents or adapts Pax Romana for Victorian Britain, is it true refers to that tendency in the 19th century um, of, uh, for, for Britain to expand and maintain its empire in a relative peaceful state through brutal and violent wars of aggression and invasion and through heavy militarization. So essentially to keep relative peace, which was never actual peace uh, inside, war was necessary. Uh, as well as as well as violent practices such as settler colonialism and genocide um, on on the outside. It is not a coincidence then that a celebration of old values of its fetishized symbols such as houses and domesticity happen at the same time as actively defending the home from from the danger of intruders. So, and when we talk about when we think about the nineteen eighties as that period when the celebration of the, the ancient house happened uh, under Thatcher. It is also important to note that those were the years of, or oh, 1982 was the year of the very brief Falcons War, which lasted about a month. Um, in, a, in a period in which Thatcher argued that the conflict was a time where Britain, and I quote, found herself again in the South Atlantic and will not look back from the victory she has won. The emphasis on the again is mine, but I think it's quite telling in terms of how, how that idea of finding oneself, finding national identity through violence, through violent aggression, is, uh, is obviously a way to look back to, to, um, to the glories of, of the past and to refer specifically here to the glories of the British Empire that had by then been already dismantled or mostly dismantled. Within this framework, then it is quite clear that the spooky Gothic undertone, the secret that the Gothic house harbors is none other but the problematic and violent histories of empire enmeshed in its foundations. But, you know, the seemingly peaceful life, I think about, for example, novels such as Mansfield Park or Jane Eyre or Howard's End or even, or even television series such as Downton Abbey, set in and around and within those big ancient houses, there are the spoils of empire screaming to come out and to voice the stories of theft, violence and silencing. And I mentioned White Sagasso C earlier, the writing of Jane Eyre seeks to address precisely this kind of silent story that uh, Charlotte Bronte's Victorian classic glosses over and does not really analyze in depth. Jane Eyre's opposite, Bertha Mason, who in White Sagasso C becomes Antoinette Cosway, is precisely this, an embodied proof of imperial schizophrenia passed on from man to man and losing her name. Deprived of her private property and her individual freedom, she voices through her madness the truth of her oppression at the hands of imperial patriarchy. Now, I know I do realize that I've spoken about many different texts in a different context before finally coming to Sarah Moss. But I think that she really taps into similar questions and similar similar uh, representations, and 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 she really deals with this this sort of literary and cultural baggage in her fiction. Now, and I was a partly new Victorian and partly not, um, but she seems to be really interested in questions about. Um, about nation, nationhood, belonging, not belonging, in relation to children, especially in representing how children are innocent victims, a bit like Bertha Mason, uh, that tell a story that had been buried for too long, as opposed to 
acting as catalysts for violent nationalistic impulses. So Ramos was born in 1975, uh, currently is professor in creative writing at University College Dublin and is the author of the novels that you can see here uh, on the slide. While she was well respected and appreciated in historical fiction circles or maybe more academic circles, it was Ghost War, published in 2018, which made her rise to prominence and, uh, and really made, made, her, uh, made a rising star out of, um, out of her. Um, hailed as a Brexit novel, as you may have noticed, the novel reflects on the link between British nationalism and a nostalgic view on British history and how these were used in the political propaganda, eventually leading to, uh, to the vote of Brexit. Um, because of these themes, and no doubt, obviously, because of the, the quality of the writing, um, she has risen to, to literary fame and is now uh, read more widely, both at university and, uh, and in general. Um, she's now published in the US as well, something that wasn't the case before, and translated, among others, into German, French and Catalan. One of her earlier novels, though, Night Waking, which is personally my favourite of hers, acts a bit as a link between new Victorian Gothic mansions and the questions that I explored before, and the question of nation, national identity, landscape and nationalism that will be exacerbated in Summer Water and Ghost War. Published in 2011, um, Night Waking can be aptly summarized by the sentence that there is nothing that has more impact on the terrors of the next generation than the way we tell stories of the past. So again, we are in the realm of the Gothic, um, as the sentence immediately shows. This novel has as its protagonist a young historian, Anna Bennett, who is on a precarious contract at Oxford University and the mother of two small boys. She spends her summer holidays in the renovated Victorian house owned by her husband Giles, who is an Oxford biology professor from an English aristocratic family, um, the family who previously owned and ruled essentially the small Scottish island where the house lies. Geographically located in the Inner Hebrides, the island is called Colsey, which uh, is based on the real island St Kilda and is as isolated as it is uncanny and idyllic at the same time. Long summer days, no cars and beautiful natural landscapes mean that there is, this is the perfect location for children to roam wild and the reason for Anna's journey to the island in the first place is her husband's research on a colony of puffins. Animals and birds in particular outnumber here human inhabitants and sudden storms can mean being cut off from the mainland for longer than expected. This is, in short, a life both of privilege, and obviously has no money worries, although she has career frustrations, um, but also of uncanny isolation. Natural and human forces can potentially disrupt the relatively peaceful existence of Anna's family on Colsey, while also bearing testimony of, to the history of trauma that the island and the house carry. Carries. In fact, it is while planting trees in the garden that her seven-year-old son, Raf, hits the small skull that marks an extraordinary find. A quick DNA search reveals that this is a dead baby, a girl who died weeks after her birth in the 1870s and was buried in the Cassingham's garden. Uh, the girl is also revealed to be Anna's husband's ancestor, as well as a material revenant of infant mortality in centuries past. While the baby could, of course, never really have been a direct ancestor role of Anna's husband, there is a quintessentially Gothic dimension to the appearance of a child from a previous generation of Cassigams to indicate the tragic appearance of a life and destiny frozen in time. Indeed, Raf experiences significant distress upon finding the dead baby, quite understandably, to the point where he starts thinking about death, nothing like being dead, and starts feeling a presence in the house's attic which he conflates with the baby's ghost returning to haunt young Cassingham's. In typical Gothic fashion, the noise is eventually located as caused by a trapped bird, which dies in the attic by suffocation, representing a repulsive counterpoint and a further memento mori to the baby found in the ground. The dead bird is also, however, a symbol of nature or the non-human forms of life interacting with entering the lives and literally the homes of humans in juxtaposition to the puffins that Giles goes out of his way to study. 
The bird trapped in the attic also has direct Victorian and new Victorian connotations too. In the scene where she declares her love to Rochester, Jane Eyre in Charlotte Bronte's novel, famously says that I, I am no bird and no net and snares me. Bertha Mason is said to make animal sounds while trapped in the attic, and in White Sagasso Sea, the end of Antoinette's childhood is tragically marked by the fire that destroys her first home and her beloved parrot Coco. In terms of who belongs or doesn't belong to the house, the bird also represents a parasitical guest, a non-human, hence less than human, vermin, so unwanted that the house itself rejected it. The dead or uncovered Victorian baby is also in a similarly liminal state, being buried in the garden just outside the house, but never really welcomed within it, in life or in death. The baby is poignantly called Eve by Anna and her family to mark the mystery of its origins. She's later discovered to have been the result of an extramarital affair between a Castingham and a poor islander, an aspect which explains the absence uh, the absence of, of uh, the baby's names from parish birth and death records and her status as an in-betweenum. Eve was born and died in 1878 at the peak of a, of a decade of extraordinarily high child mortality on the island, probably due to a tetanus outbreak caused by poor sanitary conditions of the instruments used to cut the umbilical cord. This led to the Castigan patriarch as Anna gradually uncovers in the novel to invite a nurse from Manchester called May Mobley to move to the island in an attempt to reduce the tragic rate and to introduce more modern care to childbearing women. So if the skeleton is the material appearance of Eve's tragic story, May crucially provides a textual link across the two periods, so the contemporary and the new Victorian through the letters that she writes to her sister and that Anna discovers in the attic, in the same attic where the bird had died. In the last letter, which uh, is quoted here on, on the slide, um, essentially May is resigning from her position and she's saying that there's nothing more that she can do. Um, she moves to the island in order to help childbearing women, uh, essentially not, not losing their children. She talks about how she tries, uh, she had tried to, to save this one infant. She had even uh, made a shawl for her and how essentially her help was, was not wanted, was not welcomed, and she was not called to, to, to attend and help at the, at the birth itself. And she says essentially that it is a deep conviction that the only future for these people lies away from this place. So by physically deporting them somewhere else. So there's quite a bit to unpack here. Uh, May is a middle-class girl from the city dispatched to the island. She's the daughter of an artist and, and a feminist philanthropist who obviously comes from a much more privileged, a much more educated background than the people on, on the island. She decides to leave her post essentially because she feels not welcomed. And she feels that her innovations or the innovations that she hoped to bring to, to the island in terms of maternal and baby healthcare are not accepted. On the other hand, she does not make any efforts to actually talk to and listen to and to integrate in the, uh, in the community and talk about and to women's concerns on the island, primarily because she speaks only English while the islanders speak Gaelic. While the ethical dilemma of saving lives, no matter at what cost, is one that is valid to raise here, especially for a health practitioner, it is also true that May is the representative of what is effectively a colonial dominating force. Note the proposition here in the quote to forcibly move the inhabitants uh, of the island from Colse to the mainland. Arguably, she may have the best of intentions, uh, but essentially she's, she's infantilizing the inhabitants of the island by suggesting turning them into what we would now call displaced people or internal refugees. She may without doubt have the privileges of education and networking, but she nonetheless displays a patronizing attitude that deprives the local community of agency and of a voice of their own. 
even comparing her own efforts at knitting a shawl for a baby whose parents do not do not expect to survive to the coffin that the father has preemptively made is used by her as a way to center her own experience and to reveal her biased attitude. She is, in other words, an unreliable, an unreliable and a biased narrator, and unproblematically so, since she is embedded in the complex layers of class privilege, the gender privilege allocation uh, allocated sorry, to women of her upbringing and origins over women from the rural poor island, and the privilege of being aligned with the dominating English foreign authority represented by the family that hosts her. May eventually suffers a tragic death to sort of as a, uh, as almost as retribution for her actions here. After she pens this letter, in fact, <clears throat> she embarks to return to the Scottish mainland, but gets killed in a storm on the way. A further Gothic reminder that natural elements erupt into human lives, potentially overruling human desires and agency. While it may be easier to read the storm as postcolonial retribution for the imperialist, condescending, patronizing, and biased viewpoints that May embodies, it is also true that Moss's fiction has a predilection uh, for non innocent young people, as Ghost Wall and Summer Water uh, explore more, uh, more in detail. Um, Anna's story ends, unlike May's, however, with her starting a new job at the University of Glasgow after giving a lecture on May's letters and the stories of Colse. So there is a positive New Victorian outcome of the ghosts of the past haunting the present. Crucially, Anna is able to unpack as a scholar the dangerous ideology that, ideologies that May champions in her letter. Um, essentially, she says that childbirth had become the locus of the tension between modernity and, tra and tradition, between metropolitan and peripheral ways of understanding the world. She says, if they had accepted May's support and attended the lectures she offered them, the women of Colsey would have been accepting an alien and colonial intervention in the most personal and also most political life event, the birth of a new islander. In refusing, they would expose themselves to the anger of a man who had the power to end their life on the island. But by burying the baby in secret, they were able to conceal their non-compliance. And because in the event May died at about the same time as the child she failed to deliver, no one need ever know the full story of May's failure on Colsey. And of course, and I apologize for not having included that in the uh, in the slides. <clears throat> So from the storms over the seas to the st to storms in English teacups uh, and obsessions about Englishness, Moss's more recent and shorter fiction mobilizes similar questions around home, belonging and nation in the context of rising xenophobia, fear of the other and an obsessive attachment to traditional ideas of national and cultural authenticity are crucial in Ghost War and uh, Summer Water. So the Gothic of the mansion and the ghost of the dead child are articulated alongside new variations in these two books with a child physically embodying another dead one through a performance that risks going too far in Ghost Wall. And they give greater space to the landscape uh, and nature itself. Nature, if we can call it like that, acquires agency of its own with Moss's narratives drifting into the eco-critical and in her choosing to adopt non-anthropocentric viewpoints throughout. Summer Water and Ghost Wall, I think, are also tragedies occurring over a few days in the case of Ghost Wall and on one day in Summer Water, they display that unity of time, space and action of classical plays. At the same time, the punctuation of the action with little drips of potential danger, the uncanny, the mysterious, the scary that gradually increases and the gothic undertones that end up swallowing reader and story alike suggest that these two stories converge more directly towards the horror genre as well. Not only things don't go well for humans, for innocent children, for the other, things go wrong for the whole nation and or the whole environment, here symbolically condensed within the space of the short narratives and the geographically limited and specific spaces where the action takes place. So Hadrian's Wall in Ghost Wall and, 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 the, and the Scottish Lock in um, Summer Water. 
this is what some scholars call the eco-gothic, so essentially referring to stories which expand the meaning of the Gothic from being one about the crisis of the present through a problematic immersion in the past and its traces to one where the crisis is global. And while paying attention primarily to the humans, it involves non-human actors and, uh, and uh, forms of life, essentially, uh, as, as well. So you read the excerpt, uh, or the chapter rather, the short chapter called Always Wolves, uh, from from some of us who will not read the quote out loud now, but you you have it there and you have it in your handouts. And I think that this scene is interesting because it can be potentially read in a number of ways. First of all, it is told from the viewpoint of a dome mother through the strategy of free indirect discourse and free indirect thought. Moss here, therefore, extends the female gaze central to, for instance, night waking, to this excerpt in summer water and establishes a clear mother and child link, mother uh, offspring link, similar to human mother child relations to these two animals. The sense of nervousness felt by the doe, by the doe mother, and growing fear for the impending arrival of wolves or the potential arrival of wolves creates a sense of accumulation that will culminate in the novel's climax at the end, but it builds upon that feeling of the uncanny of the fear of the known unknown that characterizes all of Moss's fiction, arguably. Considering that these animals live on the margins of the campsite where the story uh, takes place, this sense of fear and nervousness also symbolizes the risks of environmental threat posed by human activity to non-human forms of life. At the same time, the two animals could simply be seen as metaphors for the humans in the story who navigate through this one day, fearful of something terrible that will happen. After all, the wolf has long symbolized violence and patriarchal oppression in literature and culture. So the fear of the arrival of wolves can also be seen as an anticipator of the fear that a young girl, and by extension, her mother, feel at once surrounded by English and Scottish attackers in the campsite. In the chapter right after, uh, always wolves, called a stone falling. In fact, we feel that something bad happened, something involving xenophobia and racism, and importantly, something targeting an innocent child. Again, Moss is wonderful in her use of highly symbolic phrases as the titles of the chapters, since the stone falling uh, can refer to, as you know, the girl Lola's play of ricochet, but also the stone she throws at Violetta, the Scottish Ukrainian girl of the same age that she has chosen as her nemesis. Throughout this chapter and the final ones, which are also part of uh, handouts that you have, Moss stages something really interesting. Uh, a child is single out as the enemy and a child is the perpetrator. Importantly, both children are girls in a clear sign that racism and xenophobia are not just something that men ascribe to more than women. Finally, um, unlike Ghost Wall, the novel that I will talk about in a minute, um, this novel was written and said in the post-Brexit era, hence it directly engages with this key turning point in recent British and European history. The novel in fact is peppered uh, with references to how people voted or how the EU funded the building uh, of, of, of the road that leads to the campsite. And even Lola tells Violet at some point, uh, you're supposed to have left by now. You know, people like you, did you not get the message? Lola's racism parrots the racism of the adults around her, obviously. Um, while her mother potentially suffers from depression or anxiety, her father embodies the stereotypical macho, linking, uh, linking a stereotype, let's say, of a man who drinks beer and likes outdoor activities who, to, you know, the stereotype of someone who makes racist comments arguably without necessarily having the intention of, of carrying them out and turning them into actions. It is therefore particularly interesting that Moss chooses to depict a girl such as Lola, allegedly the strongest of the family, as someone who embarks onto ideologies bigger than herself and bigger than what she can really deal with. Their destructive fire and ensuing tragedy in the final chapter, which is told from the viewpoint of Lola's brother, Jack, is suggested by the narrative to have been started by Lola, who, as you may recall, has a lighter in her pocket together with her asthma inhaler. We never know whether Lola actually meant to kill Violetta, but what the narrative does make clear is that the banality of evil, 
uh, especially when voiced through seemingly unimportant comments through casual racism, can have tragic consequences in and for the young. Moss raises the question of whether Lola is to be held responsible for her acts of cruelty, given how young she is and how arguably she isn't really able to fully understand the consequences of her actions. The novel offers no answer, though, almost as if violence and racism, as brutal and dangerous as they are, are inscribed somehow in humanity's DNA or in humanity's tendencies to uh, express power, essentially, through scapegoating and through objectifying, trying to oppress and eventually destroying the other. Lola's torturing and finally killing Violetta is also an example of scapegoating, identifying an innocent person and community or community and blaming them for everything that is wrong in someone's, in someone's life. And pharmakon, which is the, the Greek word for, um, for scapegoat, was the initial title that Moss chose for Ghost Wall. Um, this very short novel, which is actually shorter than Summer of Water, is 150 pages long, uh, is set in the summer of 1990, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it focuses on Sylvie, a young teenager from a working class family in Northern England. And it is set around the ruins of uh, another wall, Hadrian's Wall, the historic northern border of the Roman Empire, one of the borders of the known world then. The wall is also often viewed as the border between England and Scotland, although the two don't fully overlap. The wall is today a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a tourist destination, but it has also been co-opted, as we can see in the novel, as a symbol of, uh, of, uh, of Britishness and, and Britain's past, past greatness. With the British Empire adopting the language and the aesthetics of the Roman Empire, it is not difficult to see how the two are made to overlap in, in Moss's novel and how the greatness of, of ancient Britons and Roman Britannia is superimposed over, over the past greatness of, of the British Empire. Indeed, the nostalgia, that some, uh, nostalgia for Britain's great past that someone like Margaret Thatcher expressed and someone like Anna Bennett in Night Waking questioned as unjust and problematic returns here in the character of Sylvie's father, an amateur historian with a penchant for Roman and pre-Roman Britain, far from uh, adopting an authentic, sorry, uh, uh, an objective uh, approach in his in his dabbling with history, however, he adopts a simplistic perspective, one based on ideas about Roman invaders superimposing and trying to destroy the great local, allegedly authentic British pre-Roman civilization. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, this is what leads him to join uh, uh, and, and dragging his wife and daughter with him, um, a social experiment, a summer camp by Hadrian's Wall, trying to reenact pre-Roman lifestyles with campfires, living in tents, no electricity, uh, and so on. The experiment is led by a professor together with his students and, um, and Bill, uh, Sylvie's father, happily sort of joins. Um, but also uses this opportunity as a way to assert his masculinity. In this particular scene, which you have not read, um, there is this interesting dialogue, this interesting exchange, where essentially the father is told that he's wrong in his interpretation of Hadrian's Wall. And the professor says, uh, you can see, said the prof, think about the stretch along windsill You've already got a bloody good escarpment running for miles. No possible need to stick a wall on tip. Doesn't make it any harder to cross or any easier to police. It's just a very impressive way of saying Rome was here. Yes, said Dad. Okay, but what about Mum tensed? Her glance flickered towards him in a way. It's a marker, said Professor Slade, the edge of empire. It's not to keep the barbarians out so much as to show where they are. It was never the Berlin Wall. No raked earth or watchtowers. Dad didn't say anything. He lifted his chin, locked eyes with the fire. Mum hunched over her rock, touched her arm where I'd seen the bruise earlier. 
this scene is a display of two patriarchal forces uh, challenging one another. While the professor is obviously more knowledgeable, Bill feels frustrated and prevaricated and his local knowledge and genuine interest have been trumped and corrected by academic scholarship. Moss carefully weaves a small reference to domestic violence in the bruise that Sylvie notices on her mother's arm as the outcome of Bill's frustration. Similarly to Summer Water, we sense, I think, that these relatively small attentions will lead to much worse. Indeed, it is possibly out of a desire to, to look strong and authoritative and to reinstate his masculinity that Bill suggests reenacting not only the outdoor living experience, but also the forms of punishment and torture that pre-Roman Britons will perform on those found guilty inside the community or those scapegoated. You have read the initial pages of Ghost War where a strange story of a girl killed in a bog is told and no reason whatsoever is given for this cruel torture and killing. Towards the end of the novel, and, um, and I apologize for the spoiler here, Moss inserts a similar scene where Sylvie will find herself in a similar position arguably so that her father does not lose face in front of the professor. Moss portrays there a cl clear gender division, which as we have seen does not hold in summer water. While the father, the professor and the maid students are enthusiastic about the reenactment of a killing with Sylvia as the victim, the only female student and Sylvia's mother, a battered wife who is afraid of her husband, are against it and eventually lead to Sylvia's rescue. Moss wrote Ghost Wall in direct response to the Brexit referendum in 2016 and its aftermath. While well, set in 1990, it significantly gestures towards the fall of the Berlin Wall as that key moment in relatively recent history, indicating hope for a more perfect union, if I may use this expression, in Europe, which eventually led to the integration of the European Economic Community into the EU in 1993. It's enlargement, the introduction of a common currency, and so on, which were only, as we know, uh, a partial, let's say, response to, or a partial solution to tensions that we still see at play now. Because of its dealing with the British reaction, or rather with the British nationalist undertones that have long inscribed Britain's reluctance to fully feel at home in the EU, Moss's novel, but, but summer water as well, can be placed within the domain of Brexit literature, or more specifically, what Christian Shaw calls Brexit. Moss in particular addresses the crucial question of landscape and national geography, upon which Shaw says what follows. In post-industrial edge lands of the North, Midlands and Wales, areas which had failed to recover from Thatcherite policies, a sense of powerlessness and impotent rage fueled unexpectedly high turnouts voting to leave. By charting the daily lives of those citizens left behind for globalization, Brexit exposes just how easily a destructive nostalgia can stimulate a belligerent national autarchism as a psychological defiance to socioeconomic disparities. Shaw, I think, says it all really here, doesn't he? Questions of geographical marginalization are what Moss also explores by placing her stories in extreme and exemplary situations, such as the summer camp in Summer Water and the makeshift historical camp in Ghost Wall. While Ghost Wall is set in 1990, it is very easy to recognize how nostalgia for a bygone era is fueled and built by political propaganda applied to his historical interests, as well as by a personal crisis that involves his social status as a working class man, he's feeling marginalized as opposed to someone like the professor and is being geographically marginalized as well. The Northeast of England, notably even now, which is where I live, uh, incidentally, is still one of the poorest areas uh, in the country. So to sum up uh, and to come to, to a conclusion, um, what I've tried to, to say today is, or what I've tried to explore today is how the nation and ideas of a national community are built through collective narratives that look back to the past, primarily to the age of empires, Victorian or Roman as they may be, because of the reassuring self-image they convey about contemporary Britain being the product of such past glories and embodying, let's say, the natural greatness of these past glories. These past systems are hierarchical, however, based on patriarchal ideas of the oppression of the other, the weaker, the outsider, the woman and the working classes. 
The landscape and national heritage, such as a stately home or the World Heritage Site of Hadrian's Wall, are often co-opted into such ideas of national belonging, precisely because they are meant to include some and exclude others. Issues of class, together with internal colonialism towards Scotland, prevail in night waking. While ghost wall and summer water show the brutal, everyday banality of evil that is the foundation for contemporary Britain's uneasy position in the world. Moss uncovers the difficult, traumatic histories from the past and importantly projects them onto children who are often seen as embodiments of hope and futurity. And she reveals, obviously, how this is ultimately a flawed reading, a flawed um, interpretation of what a child is and represents. But revealing how cruelty can affect and be perpetrated onto children in Ghost Wall and by children in Summer Water, she shows how honest digging is into the past are necessary in order to understand the present and move forward productively and positively. There is some hope in female solidarity. I think that Anna's recovering of the past stories of the islanders and of May Mobley uh, is an act of female solidarity across time. Whereas Sylvie finds the only women in the camp and expected support right when she literally needs it the most. But this is only a partial uh, solution and in a, in a way a patch. It nonetheless invites us to reflect on how easy it is to switch from national identity to national pride and nationalism and how all these are deeply embedded in ideas of masculinity and the patriarchy. And this is everything uh, from me. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for listening uh, up to here. Uh, this is a slide with the bibliography that I've used and I will be more than happy to share it with you if you're interested in, in reading more on any of these topics. And I look forward to our Q&A in a couple of days. Thank you very much and speak to you soon. <laughs>